from Psalm 100, beginning in verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness, ah, his faithfulness 
continues through all generations. Our God is faithful. But that word verse in verse 4 says, Give thanks to him and praise his name. We're going to praise his name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all. thanksgiving. We need to enter your courts with praise, and we want to honor you and give you thanks for your faithfulness. Your love does extend 
to all generations. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Okay. All right. He's going to use the pulpit. Never mind. We're good. We, I had a mic down there for you, but we just. Were, were y'all going to tell me you couldn't hear me? <laughs> I don't. I don't. Over. This, this, this I'm so glad to see you today. <laughs> How far in the sermon would you let me go for? You said, preacher, we can't hear a word you're saying. Oh my, we need to pray for y'all. You backslid. I bragged on you too soon. I'm, I truly am glad to see you. We've had a good time worshiping, though it's been long distance, but boy, it's great to see all of y'all here, some up there in the balcony, and many of you here on the ground floor. Thank you for coming today. I've come to love and appreciate your staff. Brother Andy and this praise team do such a good job leading you every week, and you know that, and uh, you're very fortunate. You're very fortunate to have such a marvelous group that not only sings well, but plays well. Miss Beth, wherever you got off to, happy 90th birthday. That's a pretty remarkable achievement. And then I also today, I'm very grateful for uh, the opportunity that you have had, and there's so many good reports come from what you're doing in the community during COVID. You have ministered to people, you've helped, given away stuff, checked on people, prayed for people, and you've done that very, very well. So I just wanna say thank you. In the name of the Lord, you are a faithful people. This morning, I see your former pastor back here and his sweet wife, Brother Buddy. It's good to see you this morning in church. I'm glad that you're here. I know he's busy now with the convention. He's an interim pastor at Hugo, and they've had some sicknesses this week that hit them pretty heavy. So he did a videotape and came live and in color here. It's good to see you back in your home church, brother. And God bless you, what you're doing for our convention and what you do for the kingdom of God and what you've done for this church. It's a privilege to be in a church that loves Jesus. And I commend you for the leadership you've given. This morning, I want to take a personal privilege and just lead us in a prayer for several things before I preach on prayer, about Jesus and prayer. This morning, we want to pray, obviously, for your search team. I can't imagine being elected to be on a pastor search team at a time when churches are not meeting. I can't imagine trying to get everybody together to go visit a church when you're not supposed to talk to anybody except six feet apart. I can't imagine trying to find a preacher in a church when part of the church is not going to be there because of concerns for COVID. Your search team needs our prayers, and I do hope you're praying for them fervently and asking God to direct them. I'm very grateful to all of you who are serving in that group, and I know you are as a church, and we want to pray for them right now in just a minute. We're going to pray for our nation. I'm old. I'm old, and I've seen us go through some difficult times, but we're back in a valley, aren't we? and so much shouting and ugliness and so much ugliness across the nation and violence and so much division and strife from the White House all the way down to the schoolhouse. I mean, every, every sector, church house, I mean, there are people just fighting. It's sad. We need God. The only thing that's going to bring people together is the Lord God. The truth is, and I've shared this many times in Broken Era, is about marriage. If you're not facing and moving toward the Lord, you're always in competition and conflict. But watch this. When, when groups move toward the Lord, and the more they get closer to the Lord, and the more they seek the Lord, and the more they seek first the kingdom, guess what direction you're going? The same direction, moving closer together as you move closer to Christ. That's what we need. And we need to pray for this nation, for our leadership, for, our, for, our, for those in local, state, and national government, for military and national guardsmen, for police officers, and for all the citizenry. And ask God this morning to bless. And then today, you know, many of you in this room are white haired, you remember well, you remember D-Day. Yesterday we celebrated 76 years. Some of you in this room that are white headed probably maybe served in World War II. I just want to say to any of you who served in our military, thank you. I've been able to live a free, as a free man and a wonderful life to have children and grandchildren, to preach in a free pulpit in a free nation because of sacrifice of patriots. 
I would be remiss if we went into this day without remembering God's goodness on this nation now for over 200 years. We are not all we ought to be, and we're not yet what we're going to be, but we're in the process of becoming what he wants us to be. And as God's people are found in prayer, he promised, if my people, you know that. And here's the part we're missing. I've seen people have prayer meetings and prayer gatherings and issues for prayer and calls to prayer, but there's a key word we're leaving out. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. How many of you heard of prayer meetings going to be nothing but repentance for an hour? Do you reckon our nation needs to repent of anything? Do you reckon our state does? Do you reckon our families do? Do you reckon I do and you do? That's what he said. So as we pray for the nation, we want to ask God to forgive us. And then this morning, on a high note, 46 years ago this evening at 8 o'clock, I got married. <laughs> that doesn't wow you. It thrills me. I, uh, Janine, Janine is my wife's name, and she's a very patient lady. She's taken care of me for 46 years. I'm very grateful for her. And the day after the service, I'm going to scoot out fairly quickly because we're going to have a special afternoon and evening to be in together. And I'm very grateful today for her and for all of you who have longevity in marriage. Thank you for your example. Can we just pray together? And we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 and see about Jesus. Father, how grateful we are today to be in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. This morning, the enthusiasm in this room is electric. The joy in singing, the response of the, of the congregation to the praise team's leading is indicative. These who are here are not here by by compulsion. They're not here out of holy habit. They're here because they love Jesus. They want to be in this room today celebrating the goodness of God. What a privilege is ours. We have an audience right now with the Almighty. I couldn't get in today to see the governor. If I tried, I wouldn't be able probably to see a senator because they're all tied up. I know I couldn't see the president, but I can walk into the throne room of the greatest potentate in all the universe, and I can come in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Today, we don't need a visit from you. We need to be invaded by your Spirit. God, I pray you'll tear down every barrier. And I pray you'll open our hearts to the grace and the mercy and the power and the goodness of God. And I pray today, God, we would do what Scripture says, that we first would be examples of repentance. You won't use us as dirty vessels. You only use that which has been consecrated. And to be consecrated means we have to be cleansed, and cleansed means we have to repent. So I pray, God, we'll turn from our sinfulness, whether it's mental or whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual apathy or indifference. I don't know what it might be in each of our lives. We all have plenty of sin, but I pray that you'll forgive us. And then today I pray you'll clean us up in the blood of Jesus Christ. And you'll fill, fill us with the power of the Almighty. And I pray as you do that here, you do that in every congregation across this nation. That today we would draw near to Christ, for you are our hope. We would turn from those things that have divided us and cling to the one who will bring us together. I pray this morning, God, that you would bless in this hour those who have served in our military. Thank you for giving us victory 76 years ago and many conflicts since. What we do with our freedom is the way we thank those who laid down their lives. Help us to use it well. Father, I thank you for your word, which really is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We're not opening this book out of, out of a sense of duty. We're hungry to be fed from the table of the Lord. So today, let us feed on your word. Grant us peace, power, might, and vision that when we leave this place, we can say together, truly, it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was praying, one other, Jake yesterday got to marry off Janae. And Jake, God bless you. What a great day that is for your daughter and for your family. That young lady's had a, quite a journey, but I'm glad today she's with her mister, and that's good. I want to invite you to open your Bibles, if you would, open to Mark chapter 1. I want us to look together. If you've been following us on live stream, you know we're going through the Gospel of Mark, one, one, one chapter, one verse at a time. So in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 35 this morning, 
Mark 1.35, Jesus, as you know, has completed the Sabbath. He's gone home to rest, and like many of you, after church, you're going to have lunch and then prop your feet. Some of you are going to take a, a nap. I think that's what they did on the Sabbath. And if you remember, Jesus went home after the Sabbath service where he cast out a demon, and sure enough, Peter and his mother-in-law had a fiery, fiery fever, the Bible says. And back then, they didn't have Tylenol and other things, and a fever could kill you. And Jesus, in a word, got her up, and as soon as he got her up, she did what Jesus does. She took on his nature. She, she came to serve, and she served all of those in the house. And that evening, people were lined up at the door saying, I've seen you drive out demons. I've heard you can heal the sick. I've got a neighbor. I've got a family member. I've got a son. I've got a daughter. And the line was long. And into the evening, he healed those that were sick. And we pick up the story, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and what it says is very clear, very early. In case you think that's ministerially speaking, he clarifies. Very early in the morning, how early was it? Mark, is still dark. Jesus got up and he went out and he made his way to a deserted place. And he was praying there. As he, and, he was praying there. and Simon and his companions, and this word searching literally means were hunting him down. They weren't casually saying, Jesus, Jesus. they were on a mission to say, we got to find him now. There was an urgency. Look what it says. They were searching for him, and they found him and said, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on, not back to Capernaum. Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. And so he went to all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. I, I think you got up this morning the way Jesus got up on that day after the Sabbath, very early in the morning. I can tell by the way you're singing, you're glad to be here. I, could watch, I watched you as you were coming in, and y'all were just about to die, just hug a neck. You were just, you were just having withdrawals. I, I saw you reach out and with a hand to shake, and then realize, oh, I can't do that. Why? Because you're eager to be in the house of the Lord. You came this morning with a holy expectancy. You said, I've missed seeing my people. I've missed being with the Lord. I've missed opening my Bible with those that I've made the journey with. And that's the way Jesus was. After the Sabbath day, you know who he wanted to go see? His father. Some of you have grandchildren and you love them, but aren't taillights good when they drive home? Now really, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, they're fun, but, but if you're not 25 anymore, it doesn't take long to say, you know, maybe they could come early today, right? Maybe they could come get them now, you know. And, and that's the way it is because after a while, even you young mothers, you long to have a sitter keep your children so you can go to your husband, and go with your husband out to dinner and talk in complete sentences, don't you? You're only in trouble when you go out to a steak dinner with your husband if you got preschoolers and you start cutting his steak for him. You've been too long since you went on a date. See, the truth is you long for adult conversation. You want to talk about a topic that a two-year-old knows nothing about, a five-year-old can't comprehend, a seven-year-old not interested in. How do you think Jesus felt? He suddenly has come already encapsulated in clay. He already has left the omniscient, uh, the, the, the omnipresence that he had in spirit because in a body you're limited to one place. You, you talk about cramped style. Here, here's one who stretches from the age of ages past, the age of ages to come, is bigger than the universe he created, and now he's walking in a capsule of clay on the dusty sands uh, of Israel. The Bible says when he got there, he longed early in the morning to go be with his father. Why? Because when he was alone in prayer, he could talk in mature language with his own, his own father. Father and son could commune father with son. He could talk in terms that they understood each other. He could be alone in the omniscient presence, omnipotent presence of the father. And he said, i got to get up early. I can't wait to go and visit him. It's the way you mamas feel when you're going to get to go visit that son or daughter on a college campus. And I don't care how hard you've worked the day before. You're up early saying, hurry, let's get in the car. I want to go see him now. Sometimes we run away from prayer because we don't feel that bond with God. We know about him, and many of us could quote many principles on prayer, and we could discuss what it means to have conversational prayer or intercessory prayer or thanksgiving prayer or petitionary prayer or supplication prayer. We can teach it, but we don't do much of it. I don't know this about Tahlequah, so forgive me. I'm not shooting at you, but I was a pastor of one church in Oklahoma 33 years, and the lowest attended service we'd ever have was a prayer gathering. We could have Easter and put chairs in the aisles. We could have a guest concert person that everybody liked to buy their, album, their, their, their CDs, and we'd have to put chairs in the aisles. We didn't ever have to put chairs in the aisles if we had a prayer meeting. In fact, most often, we wouldn't even need to go to the worship center. We could have met 
in a side room. Now, I'm sure that's not true of Tahlequah, but it's true of a church I knew for 33 years. Isn't that sad? We talk about prayer, and we, we mean to pray, and we're going to gather, but so often our prayers are pretty superficial. Many times when we pray, it's a phrase we heard from this one and a phrase we heard with that one. Now we put together our own quilt of this one's phrase and that one's phrase, and there's not one thing original from our heart. When I talk to my children, if they only repeat the same phrases back to me that they said yesterday and the day before, I'd say, what's wrong with you? Well, Daddy, we've had a good week. Children doing good. I've enjoyed my job. Got paid Friday. You know, I washed my car. <sighs> That's about all I know. It's great to talk to you, son. Can I ask you a question? Are you still praying the same prayers you prayed when you were first saved? Are you still quoting the same phraseology? If you talk to your wife at the depth you talk to God, would you still be married? Here's the way most pray, and I don't mean to be ugly. I'm fully capable. I'm fully ca I don't mean this ugly. I'm just trying to show us where we are. To all when we pray, it's Father, thank you this day and all you many blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in worship. We pray you bless those that are sick and help them be better soon. Bless the missionaries and watch over and use them. If anybody lost in here, I hope you get them saved. And watch over and give us traveling mercy as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. That didn't move you off your seat. And yet we think that's going to move the God of heaven. You know why Jesus wanted to get up and go early to pray? I want to go be with my father. We want to, I've got some things I want to talk about. And the Bible says he got up early and he went out. Why? Because if you remain, how many of you are going to pray the last thing in the day? And you put your head on the pillow and you mean well, you mean well, but suddenly it feels so good to get in those sheets and that head on that soft pillow. Father, oh, I just want to thank you for the day. And I want to pray for the meeting of God in the morning. And if you, anybody want to be guilty, admit you're guilty? But why did Jesus get up when he woke up? <laughs> he was flesh and blood. The Bible says early in the morning, while it was still dark, he didn't wait for the alarm clock. They didn't have them. He didn't wait for the first light of the day. The eagerness of being with his father was so compelling. It says he got up early and he went out. He moved out away from where he was to separate himself from anything that would be a distraction to really visiting with, with, the, with the Lord. It says he got up before daylight, knowing others would be sleeping. As long as they're sleeping, they're not looking for him. Did you understand that sometimes the greatest time you can have is set your alarm for an appointment with God? If you got children, they're not going to jump up early to be with you. Excuse me, if you're a teenager, they're not. <laughs> if you want to really meet God quietly, get up early in the morning. The Bible says he got up early and he went to a different place and he set himself apart to pray. Jesus always had special times of prayer, separated prayer. The Bible says the Gospel of Mark, he had a time of prayer before he went preaching. He went into, into the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights and confronted Satan. And after 40 days of, pre, of prayer, he came into Galilee preaching. The Bible says he prayed all night before he chose the disciples. The Bible says he, 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 he was in the midst of praying. When he walked on the fourth watch of the night, he walked on the water. You know what the fourth watch is. Sometime between 3 and 6 a.m. when it's just beginning to get barely daylight. Just enough you can see forms and figures but still dark. And they're in a terrible storm and here comes Jesus walking in the water. Where did he come from? The Bible says he was praying when he told them you go to the other side. The Bible says he was praying at the transfiguration when suddenly his face was radiant. His clothes were whiter than fuller soap could make, could make them. He was praying during the betrayal in the garden and he prayed while he was on the cross. He made his way to a desert place. Now, that's not the wilderness desert. There's no, there is no desert in Galilee. Galilee is the, is the bread basket. Galilee is fertile and green. The Sea of Galilee is in the heart of it. it that's where I told you they talk about shepherding and fishing and farming and all those things, seed sowing. That, that's the garden belt. Galilee was the northern area where people knew, knew about greenery and, and, and all kinds of nice farm fields. The wilderness of Judea is down south. So when it says he went to a desert place, it should say deserted. He went to a place he knew they wouldn't be. He, knew he went to a place that wasn't in the town. He went to a place outside the city thinking if I get up early, it's still dark. I'll go out there and nobody's going to bother me. And by the way, for a long time they didn't. The Bible says this wilderness is not by accident. It's in the wilderness that God worked with the people of God for 40 years. Do you understand two million Jews left 
left Egypt into Israel. Do you remember how many of the originals made it in? Two million left Egypt. How many of the original two million made it in? Why? It says the rest of them died in the desert because of their rebellion against God. The Bible says the wilderness is a proving ground. It was in the wilderness where John the Baptist went to preach in the desert wilderness of Judea where he said, if you really want to come to God, you're going to come out from among the world. You're going to come out to a difficult place. You're going to come to a place that's parabolic of how your life is when you do not know Christ. You want to come to Christ, come to God, you're going to have to come out. That's what the word ecclesia, the word church means, come out from among them and be different. The Bible says the wilderness is a place where Jesus confronted Satan and he whipped him. Wilderness in scripture, desert places where God does his great work. And the Bible says he was praying there. This is a word, and it doesn't matter what the word is in Greek, but it's a word that literally covers, it's an umbrella word to use every aspect of prayer. It's a word that means fervent and urgent. It's a word that includes submission. When it says he was praying, it means he was submitting again to the will of God. Why? Would you not think it's hard to wake up every morning and be in this? When you were used to being that, through the years our church in Broken Arrow was very gracious to send me on several mission fields I never thought I'd ever get to see. But I got to tell you, two or three of those, about the second or third day, I'm counting hours till I could leave that place and come home. Food was awful, accommodations were dirty, the people couldn't understand me and I sure didn't understand them and though I had a heart for their souls, the living conditions were awful, and I'd get up in the mornings and pray, God, forgive me for having such a desire to get home when you brought me here to do a work. Help me this day to see the people as people needing you and not the surroundings. You reckon Jesus got up every morning that was his creation, and suddenly he was not omnipresent, he was limited. Do you reckon it bothered him that he got up in the morning and he felt tired? He'd never known that. You think it bothered him that he'd go through a day and feel hunger? He, he'd never known that. You think it bothered him when he sweat or when he was thirsty? He'd never known that. You ever thought, do you think it ever bothered him when he smelled the smells of people who didn't know what cleanliness really was? The Bible says he went to the Father and he went there urgently and he wanted to be with him and he prayed fervently in his word of submission to God, to his will, confession, petition, supplication, intercession, praise, and thanksgiving. And the word is, it confers this word. Now, stay with me. The Bible says in the book of James, it says, the Lord honors the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous man. That's what this word, prosyukamo, is for. It's a picture of somebody who prays with great intensity. Have you ever been with somebody who really knows how to pray and it's a local call? A handful of times. A handful of times I've met laymen whose ministry was prayer. And the minute they said, Father, there was a holy hush. Because when they talked to God, it wasn't rote, it wasn't form, it wasn't facade, it was open hearted faith. Father, and they began to pray. Jesus, when he prayed, was fervent and effectual. The word fervent literally is from a word we get our word energy from, energeo. It's the picture of electrons flowing through a wire to brighten and light up a circuit. When he prayed, it was the power, the power of godliness flowing into the power of God Almighty, flowing together, Father and Son. And there was a fervency and a power in his prayer that was absolutely Remarkable. You know, prayer will change people. So often we want God to change what He's doing for us, but really what it does is change you toward what God's will is. I don't know if you saw it this week. In fact, I want to get his name Gordon Garen Hoskins. Garen Hoskins, a police officer in Nashville, Tennessee. Did y'all see that on the news? Garen Hoskins was standing his duty as a police officer while people came forward protesting. And, and there was a young man who came forward, and, and it was not hostile. It wasn't, they weren't tearing up anything. It was a peaceful protest, but they were shouting at the police. And Garen Hoskins was standing on duty, and here comes a young man, an African-American young man, and he's preaching. Garen Hoskins is a Christian. The African young man, African-American young man, stands right by where Garen Hoskins is, and he's preaching. And in a minute when he took a breath, Garen said, Sir, I take it because you're preaching, you really are a Christian. He said, Yes, sir. 
He said, I am too. He's a police officer. This is a demonstrator. I, 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 I know the same Lord you know. And the young man said, you do? He said, I do. He said, in fact, I'm praying for you all, and I hope you're praying for us. We need peace, and we want to do what's right. And they began to converse. And then Mr. Officer Hoskins said, young man, could I just pray with you? A police officer to a demonstrator, Nashville, Tennessee. May I just pray with you? And that young African American put down his signs and his sign and his banner, and they put one arm on each other and they began to pray for each other. And when they did, unbeknownst to Officer Hoskins, somebody got a picture. The previous picture showed some of the demonstrators throwing rocks at them. I believe in the Old Testament, you were stoned if people didn't like you. Some of the demonstrators throwing rocks at them for an officer and an African-American man joining in prayer. Somebody got the picture and it immediately went global. <laughs> Afterwards, Officer Hoskins was asked, did you know that young man? He said, no, but I sure wish I'd gotten his name. He said, you know, he's a really fine young man. They said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, I, I would really, he's the kind of young man I'd really like to just sit down and visit with and talk to and get to know. Reckon what the answer for peace is. If my people were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'd hear from heaven. I'd forgive their sin and heal their land. Prayer's amazing. The founder of Salvation Army was an Englishman by the name of William Booth. His ministry was really in East London. 1865, he was 36 years old. He founded the Salvation Army at age 36. Today's global. It was William Booth who said this about prayer. When you pray, you must pray with all your might. That doesn't mean saying your prayers or sitting gazing about in church or chapel with eyes wide open while somebody else prays for you. It means fervent, effectual, untiring, wrestling with God. It means, that grappling, it means grappling with the omnipotence that clinging to him, following him about, so to speak, day and night as the widow did to the unjust judge. Call out to him with agonizing pleadings and arguments and entreaties until the answer comes and the end is gained. I thought he was a Christian. Why you gotta do it with that intensity? Listen, this kind of prayer, be very sure, this kind of prayer, the devil in the world and your own indolent, unbelieving nature is gonna oppose. They will, they will pour water on this flame. They will ply you with suggestions and difficulties. They will ask you how you can expect that the plans and purposes and feelings of God can be altered by your prayers. They, they will, these demons will begin to talk about impossibilities and predict the failure of your prayer. But if you mean to succeed, you must shut your ears and your eyes to all but what God said and hold him to his own word. And you cannot do this in any sleepy mood. You cannot be prevailing Israel unless you wrestle as Jacob wrestled, regardless of the time, aught else, save obtaining the blessing sought. That is, pray with all your might. Man, I don't, please, I, I'm just here to ask questions. You have to answer. When's the last time your wife saw you praying and thought you were drunk because you were praying such, such fervency? Do you know why in the, New, in the Old Testament, do you know why Eli saw a woman praying and thought she was drunk because she was praying so fervently? He hadn't seen anybody pray fervently in a long time. He saw them come and go through their ritual. The Pharisees, the, 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 the holy ones, the, the, the dedicated Jews would come and put on their prayer shawl and they go through the mantra of their Deuteronomic prayers. But this lady, crying out for Samuel to come as a son, called on God with such fervency and such wailing and beseeching the throne and calling out the name of God and pleading and begging and calling out scripture until Eli saw it and thought, she must be drunk. Wasn't it Jesus who said, my father's house should be called a house of prayer? Suppose Jesus neglected prayer. Well, what if he didn't take time to pray? Then he'd come out in the mornings and he maybe would have said something like, well, I'll tell you right now, I don't feel very good today. I don't want to see you people. Back off. Leave me alone. I need some space here. Don't come asking me for something. Wouldn't that have been a treat? Do you know why he could always be ready to meet the crowd? Because he's already met the Father. 
You know why he was ready to help the hurting? Because he'd already met the one who was their healer. You, you know why he could t be tenderhearted to the children? Because he'd met the one who made every little boy and girl red and yellow, black and white, who are precious in his sight. The Bible says when he prayed, there was a necessity. The Bible says it's not only the spirit which God cherishes toward a man, the spirit which he cherishes toward man, but that which he cherishes toward God that ensures that man's heart will be right. When you and I really pray, we stand on the promises of God. If I were to take you, ask you, I'm not, so relax. But if I were to ask you to take out a clean sheet of paper and a pencil, some of you immediately would feel like you're in the ninth grade again and get panicked. But if I said take out a clean sheet of paper and a pencil, and I said I want you to write 10 promises, 10 promises that you claim when you stand before God in prayer. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, you better put on the whole armor of God. Because in the evil day, you're going to need to stand. And having done all, putting on the suit of armor, stand. And once you've done all things, be sure you stand. <laughs> what are you going to stand on? We used to sing it in church, standing on the promises. What are the promises of God? We stand on the fact that he promised to be present. He said, I'll never leave you. We stand on the promise of his protection. We stand on the promise of his power, his provision, of his leading, of his, of his purposes, his rest, his goodness, his faithfulness, and his guarantee. The Bible says Jesus was out there praying, and wouldn't you know it? You ever been praying and somebody, preacher? Well, they didn't say that to you, but call you by name? Or, mommy, daddy, or that cell phone you forgot to cut off and it keeps dinging and dinging and somebody's trying to get your attention and you just went to pray. Now, now listen to this. Here's Jesus praying. You're not going to be shocked. Who, who came looking for him? The one who's always got to do the talking. You don't have anybody like that. I better be careful. I'm sure you don't have anybody like that in your Sunday school class that always wants to answer, do you? Don't, don't point to you. Don't, don't point to anybody. Do you have anybody in class that when you ask a question they always want to answer? Yeah. You know what that name was in Scripture? Peter. In fact, Peter was answering so often. That's why in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You're the Christ, the Son of God. Don't say that Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon. No, 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 no. He had heard every answer Peter ever gave. And the minute Peter got it right, he said, Blessed are you, Simon. You didn't get that on your own. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father, which is in heaven. Here's Peter, and he's coming and tell Jesus what he ought to do. Why? Jesus. What are you doing right out here in the early morning? Well, they're already lined up at my house. Last night was wonderful. We've been fishing before and had done that. Good pre Jesus, they're lined up. They, they've gone to other communities and they're lined up at my door. And you need to come back. You can pray anytime. You need to come now. You haven't ever told God what he ought to do, have you? Have you? Here's Peter saying, Jesus, you need to come back right now. They're at my house and they're waiting on you. Do you understand when you pray, you're not trying to pull God in. You're trying to pull you to Him. It's boat season. Some of y'all got boats. Some of you may be out there yesterday or going to be out there this afternoon. And when you approach that dock to dock your boat, you throw the rope to somebody on the dock, you're not trying to pull the dock to the boat. You're trying to pull the boat to the dock. When you hurl a prayer Godward and you're asking, Lord God, hear me now. In the name of Jesus, I come to you in the power of your Holy Spirit. Best I know my heart ready to meet you in prayer. Here's my petition. Here's my supplication. Now, God, speak to me. And what I want him to do in that moment is take me and the little rope that I've set up that's so flimsy and grab that small cord and pull me to himself so that I can literally pray like Jesus, not my will but thine be done. I can't imagine Jesus on his way to the cross and the weight of the sins of the world dating back to Adam. And yet in that moment, knowing what he's about to endure for the next hours, and taste something the Lord of life had never known, and that's death, he could still pray fervently, Father, not my will, three times. Do we ever get mad with God because he didn't answer? Maybe he did answer. Do your children ever say, are you going to answer me? I did answer. The answer is no. No, I mean, are you going to tell, can I go? Did you hear me? You ever seen a child at a candy counter store? I love children. 
They, they, they don't think they put those candy bars right there before you check out. They're not there by accident. They're there for children. Look at what level they are. They're there for children. Why? I stood behind mamas, going around to get one or two items, stood behind mamas, and there's a little five-year-old. And here's what he said, Mama, can I have this? No. Can I have this? No. Could I have that? No. Can I have this? No. Could I have this? No. Mama, th can I have two of these? No. 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 If I, she, you know what she says? Okay. Why are you groaning? I say, that's not going to happen. Why? You gave an answer. What was the problem? I don't like that one. Have you ever said, God, are you going to answer me? He said, I did that three weeks ago. I don't, I, don't, I don't like that. I, I answered. The Bible says when Jesus got alone with God and he called on the Lord, he, Simon said, Simon comes to see him and said, Master, and it means he's hunting him down. You need to come now. They're waiting at my door and they want to see. Did you notice the Bible says when Jesus heard Simon's plea, did you see what it said in verse 39 or 38? I heard you, Peter, verse 38. I heard you. We're going to go to the neighboring villages. Lord, that's not what I ask you. I want you to come to Capernaum. That's my hometown. We're going to the other villages, Peter, because I need to go preach there too. That's why I've come. So he went to all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now, one thing, we're going to quit. Here it is. See, sometimes when we don't get the answer we want, we, we get mad at God, kind of like a child. Well, well I, I, you know, I asked, I asked for this, and, and you didn't get me what I asked for. You, you're never guilty of being a childish instead of childlike, are you? I, I didn't want that answer. But, but Lord, you're, 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 you're supreme, and you're sovereign, and you're in charge, and you see what I can't see, and you may not give me what I think I want because you want to give me what I really need. When you were a child, did you love that aunt that always gave you socks if you were a boy? I didn't like her. <laughs> I did not like her gifts. I didn't even like it when she came to our house Christmas because I knew what was in that box and she looked like I'd be surprised. I tell you, I liked my granny. She gave me good stuff to play with. When you pray, are you ever mad when God gives you socks? He says, I know what you want, but here's what you need. i got a three-year-old granddaughter, and when she comes to our house, we say, it's time for lunch. She's three year old, years old. I want ice cream. She's at a person after my own heart. <laughs> but if I gave in every time and gave her what she wanted, would that be good for her? And you know what? When I don't put ice cream on the table, I don't want this. I want ice cream. I said, we got to eat that first. I don't want this. <laughs> she, she misunderstood the answer. She doesn't like the answer. Do you understand when you're praying, is God trying to pull you into his will and pull you under his authority and pull you into his plan instead of letting you be a renegade and get what you want versus what you need? I, I don't know where this came from. Tradition says it came from the body of a Confederate soldier. Now, whether it did or not, I don't know. But listen to what this says. I ask God for strength that I might achieve I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I could be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked God for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel my need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life so that I could enjoy, could enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but I got everything I'd hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all people most richly blessed. This week as I watched our world, slowly, our nation slowly attacking itself, I kept thinking of a hymn. I used to love to sing the chorus. You know it. Here it is. I tell you what, do I'm not a vocalist, but if you'll sing with me, we'll pretend. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What are you going to do? Look full in his wonderful face. Why? For the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light. Would you stand and let's sing it one more time, and I'm going to pray. Sing it together. Turn. 
Father, what a privilege this morning to hear praise on the voices and the lips of your people. It must be wonderful on the Lord's day in heaven to hear every time zone, believers from every tongue and language and people and nation singing praise to the Almighty. In this place in Tahlequah, we have the privilege of using our tongue and our language and our mind and our heart to praise the Lord. Father, we need that, not only in our hearts individually, we're in dire need of that as a nation. I would pray that in the midst of this upheaval, there could come one of the greatest awakenings ever. For in order for an awakening to come, we have to be stirred from our comfort zones to be discontented with where we are because we long to be with God in, in fellowship and obedience. It may be today in this very room, there's someone here that says, you know, I, I really would like to spend a few moments in prayer with the Almighty, please remind them. They don't need an invitation to do that. You said your house should be called a house of prayer. It'd be wonderful day if we had church and prayer broke out. Maybe there's somebody this morning say, Brother Nick, all this week God's been dealing with me. I've come this morning, I'm not accustomed to coming, but I came this morning because I just need to know Jesus. If so, in a moment we're gonna invite you just come and be seated on this front row. And after the service, there'll be folks that'll be delighted to visit with you. We don't want you to feel uncomfortable. We're, we're gonna wear masks and allow you to be safe. But maybe you say, I just would like to talk to somebody about knowing Jesus, you come. If maybe you're here and say, I've been attending the church and I wanted to join a long time ago, but we stopped because of COVID. I'd like to come this morning and join this church. Will you come be seated on the front row? And after the service, someone will be talking to you, be willing to talk to you, tell you how. Maybe this morning you just need prayer why don't you come and be seated on this front row in a moment? And by doing so, you'd be saying, I just want somebody to pray with me. Wouldn't it be sweet this morning to see two or three surrounding a brother or sister in prayer asking for God's blessing? Father, we don't know the needs of the hearts you do, but I pray in this moment no one will feel difficult, uh, feel distant, feel a divide between them, themselves and the Lord, but they feel a closeness and as your voice encourages hearts and your call goes out to your people, I pray you'll bring those to come today to make peace with God. For those of us that say, Father, I am your child. I'm in good fellowship with you. I pray we'll be found on the front lines of calling on God to minister, to heal, to forgive, to bind us together, and to once again let us be united as a nation under the glory and the power of the Lord. Speak to us in this place of prayer right now as we sing together in Jesus' name, amen. Touch. 
worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I'm Tim Kelly. I'm on the search committee, and I want to just thank you for praying for us. Um, there's eight of us, uh, Dalton, Chuck, Amanda, Brandy, Luke, Jordan, and myself. And during the pandemic, we have been meeting online every week, so we appreciate your prayers. I mean, I'm still learning new technology, you know, kind of like a dog learning new tricks. You ever heard of Zoom? I haven't heard of Zoom since... Uh, 12 weeks ago, so I can Zoom pretty good now. So we're learning how to Zoom, so it's another thing. Then this week they're talking about Google Docs, and I don't, you know, all your teachers out there know that stuff. So I'm still learning new technology, so pray for me because i got to get on there and be there at the right time, and, you know, so it's a coordination thing. So I went on vacation one week, and uh, 
they uh, videotaped it, so I tried to watch it later. So I'm trying to stay connected, even though we're all in different places. So we appreciate technology and that we can do that. But kind of where we are now, we have met online with three pastors. So uh, we sent out a bunch of surveys, and we have talked to three of them just online. So right now we're sending out references, and we got the references back. And this week we have Monday and Tuesday night set up to talk to those references online on Zoom. So we're still in initial stages and uh, we appreciate you praying because, man, there's, we had a whole bunch and you have to cut some and you got to know who do you want to pursue, who do we not want to pursue. And so as a committee we meet and we pray and just appreciate you praying. But a few things I want specifically want you to pray for wisdom as we ask questions. I mean, when you meet with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you can see their body language and you can talk to them and things. But when you're on a camera right there, you know, you don't get all those cues. So pray for wisdom as we ask questions that we may be able to discern who God wants. Pray for the pastor and his family that God is moving in their heart now, and I know they are, and uh, we want to find that one. And uh, kind of my prayers, pray that the cream will rise to the top. I mean, we want the man that God wants here, and uh, it's a big task, and we're serious about it, and I appreciate y'all praying for us, and as we continue, we hopefully give you more updates, but uh, we haven't narrowed that down yet but so thank you very much Amen. God is still at work whether it's our pastor search committee saving people and uh, thank you brother Nick for bringing this this message this morning uh, are you glad to be here this morning so good to see you here uh, I do have a couple announcements so we have uh, a couple things that are coming up Father's Day is coming up in two weeks and a gentleman wanted me to let you know that uh, we're going to have a parent-child dedication, and it's going to be on Father's Day in two weeks. And if your family would like to participate, please contact Janelyn if you can do that this week. And also to let you know, we're going to have another worship service Wednesday night uh, for our youth, and it's a youth, it's a worship setting, um, and you know it's, it's going to be a worship service that's going to be in our chapel at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night for our students. And so you can pray for them as they return in a worship setting as well. Uh, soon we will be get to begin having small groups and we'll let you know when we have those but it's great to see you face to face we had more than 225 people here with us this morning in worship and uh, we can celebrate us being together and also want to uh, thank those who are still watching live stream and uh, that you're participating in worship with the body of Christ you are part of the body and uh, you get to be the church and uh, so you haven't been forgotten. We love you and we celebrate a risen Savior with you even here this morning today. Um, as we go out into our community, uh, this is the end. Um, let's continue to walk with the Lord, rejoicing and praying. First thing when we get up, I think we heard the challenge, didn't we? And uh, as our Lord did this, I think that we need to be doing the same thing and we can be proclaiming what Jesus has done. He's changed our lives. We serve a risen Savior, and so let's rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all stand and be dismissed in prayer. We are going to pray. Lord God, we love you. We thank you so much that we could come to this place. We know that's more than 225 people as we people are even watching and praying with us at this time. Lord, this is your people that you send out into a, a field of harvest Lord, to proclaim what you've done, and it, you, you started with us. You started with me changing this life, um, that I died to myself, took up the cross, <laughs> and have followed you. Lord God, that we will continue throughout this week to exalt and lift you up and live for you, Lord God. And uh, Lord, you see your church at work as we work along with you in this community and our world that, in which we serve. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends.
One more thing I left out of our announcements. We need to see a, a good vast majority of you here tonight for our, uh, to, so we can have a quorum for our business meeting. Somehow I left that out. So tonight at 6 o'clock here in the same place, we'll have our business meeting. Thank you. 5 o'clock. Excuse me, 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock.